What type of literature are the Gospels? Just thinking, thinking about it in, ter- in literary terms, what, what type of literature, what would you, how would you describe the Gospels? A biography? Okay, yeah. Yeah, they, they are a biography, perhaps in small measure, autobiographies and little snippets, but largely a biography. They're eyewitness accounts. Does anybody in here drive a gray van from Clay County? No? Okay, thank you. Sorry to bother you. They, they are uh, biographies. They're, they're, they're really eyewitness accounts. Now, we think about the writers of the Gospels, uh, Matthew and John. What, what do we know about them? How, how and what, what way were they eyewitnesses? Not a trick question. <laughs> yeah, they, they were two of his apostles. Yeah, so, so Matthew and John were, were with Jesus as, as two, two of his, his apostles. And then Mark and, and Luke uh, probably were around uh, to, to at least to a certain extent. And then probably history would suggest that much of their teaching uh, they, what they wrote about, they got from uh, Peter principally uh, recounted to them uh, by him and from him as they recorded it. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what, what do you see as being different about their accounts in general terms than John's account? I'm sorry? Okay, starts with his birth. I think they tell many of the same stories between those three that you mentioned. And, and some, many of John's stories are only found in John. Uh huh. Right. Yeah, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke seem to be um, very um, orderly eyewitness accounts. You know, Jesus was here, he went here, he had this conversation, he did this, he said this. Almost like a reporter might record events as they're occurring. John's gospel is not that way. John's gospel is much more compressed. Uh, Nine of the chapters deal with the last week of Jesus' life and the time following the resurrection. So almost half of his gospel is compressed down to a week's time. Most of John's gospel are long discourses where Jesus speaks and John records long conversations that Jesus had with people and things that he went through. John also uses a lot of uh, repetitive um, imagery like light and dark, life and death, Things like that are unique to John that are not true of the other gospel writers. And so, well, as we get into the book, I think, I think you'll, it, it's important to recognize that John's purpose in writing and how then it can speak to us is going to be a little bit different than the other gospel messages. In fact, I think that John's um, gospel message is I, I, I will say, I believe is more authentically gospel-oriented than Matthew, Mark, and Luke in that John has a perspective of wanting to speak to Jesus and how he uh, interacted on a, on a much more personal level. And, and that's why John's gospel is written the way that it is. But let's dive into uh, to, to the to book into chapter 1 and look at the uh, first five verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the The darkness has not understood it. So John kicks off his book talking about 
the Word. Now, I, I would encourage you, I, I, I know it's not entirely possible to divorce your, in your mind what you already know, but I'd encourage you, try to think about, come at this from a, a, fresh, a little bit of a fresh perspective. I don't think we're going to say something that some of you, at least many of you, probably have not already heard, but sometimes if we can have, reset our mind and have a fresh perspective, we can pick up aspects of truth that we may have missed at another time. And so I would encourage you, if you can, to try to do that. When we think about the Word, John's readers, both Gentiles and Jews, would have not had the same thought that we have because we've heard this teaching so much that we have the benefit of 2,000 years worth of time that our mind goes to a very different place than what theirs would have. I think it's helpful if we could sort of see what his readers would have been understanding and then see how that relates to us today and I think it may open up a fresh window not a not a different perspective but I think a fresh perspective that that may shed some light in some ways that that you will find helpful the 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 Greek hearers the the Greek readers that John would have had would have thought of the word uh, the, the Greeks had as I, as I understand it they had about three different terms that were commonly used for uh, the word, the logos. Uh, two of those would be significant to this discussion. One of those would have been the communicated word or the written word, just the way we would commonly think about it. I'm speaking to you with words. They're short units of communication that we string together in a way to communicate a thought or an idea. A second way that the Greeks would have thought about it, and the one that John uses here, is one that deals with not the communicated word, but the, the unspoken word, a sense of almost like a force or a principle, somewhat akin to our idea of reason or intelligible thought. And the Greeks, of course, were really big with, with reason. Um, they thought the world was ordered. And so they would not have thought of that reason as being God, they would have just thought of it as being a principle, a force of some type that ordered the universe. And so when they heard this, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, I doubt that that would have phased them much at all, because they probably would have thought, yeah, there, you know, there's lots of gods, and sure, this force was around with, if you want to say it was around with your God, then so be it. That would not have shocked John's Greek hearers and readers at the time he was writing this. The Jews, <clears throat> excuse me, the Jews on, an, on the other hand would have thought about that differently. They would have thought about that the way that that term is used often in the Old Testament. Uh, for example, in, in Psalm uh, 33, and verse uh, 6, the writer says, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. They would have thought of the word as something that was active, as an active force. And they would have attributed that to Yahweh, but they would have thought of the word as an active force that, um, that, that God brought to bear uh, in creation. Or Isaiah 55, 11, uh, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose I have for it. The word was an active force, and his Jewish readers would have thought that. So, a Jew hearing or reading what John had to say, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, would not have, also would not have been phased by that because they would have thought well yeah that's the way God works that's the way God operates that wouldn't have been a shock to them it wouldn't have been strange to them they wouldn't have thought anything about it it would have seemed uh, perfectly reasonable and nor uh, uh, normal and in fact the Jews oftentimes thought about 
uh, that concept of the word as the wisdom would be somewhat synonymous with that. And we see that is personified, uh, namely in the in Proverbs, oftentimes is wisdom is acting. You know, the 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 writer of the wisdom literature talks about wisdom walking in the streets or wisdom being personified in other ways. And that, that notion would have been similar. The third thing that I think comes to bear and it is, is useful to our, to our understanding the text. The, the Jewish uh, teachers and scribes over the years developed well let me back up the jews were very hesitant and in fact more than hesitant they just did not in the synagogue want to read scripture and read the name of god in scripture so we freely say in the beginning god did this well they they would have never said in the beginning yahweh they would have replaced Yahweh in the text with an alternate reading because they went so far as to be afraid that they were even mispronouncing the name of God. Now, on the one hand, you can say, well, that's great. They're te- treating God as, as holy and, and as who he is, but that seems to be a bit of an overkill, and I'm not sure that God would have been that fussed about it. But nonetheless, that's what they did. And they kept in written form uh, things, writings that were called targums that would have been the way that they interpreted these for public reading purposes the old testament scripture and these these translations and interpretations of the old testament scripture and targums can shed some light on uh, how different uh, words are used and in fact in exodus 19 and verse 17 Uh, It says, Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet the word of God. And that word of God was a a substitution for what was in the original text. And the original Hebrew was a substitution. But what's worth noting is that what they used to substitute was the word of God. They treated that notion of the word being active in Jewish thought as a, a name or an indication of the deity himself. Okay? So now, with that in mind, we could see that nothing in these <clears throat> first five verses that we read would have been disturbing to either the Greek or the Jewish readers about um, the, 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 this notion of the word. They would not have thought anything... Of, well, they would have thought what they commonly thought that is the greeks it's a force it's a principle and the jews would have thought yes it's an active way that god works in our world then when you continue uh drop down to verse 10 he was in the world and uh, though the world was made through him the world did not recognize him he came to that which was his own but his own did not receive him Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human uh, decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. I doubt that anything in those verses would have caused them to feel any differently because they would have thought about the natural relationship that God had with with his people the Jewish readers would have thought that and the Greek readers would have thought well you know the the Jewish deity interacts with his people the way that he chooses to interact with them the the kicker comes in verse 14 that's when John writes something that would have shocked both his Gentile readers and his Jewish readers. He says the word, that same, same concept, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. I, everything that I've read and everything that I, I've studied even outside of scripture would suggest that the greek readers would have been 
shocked and appalled at a deity the way that the Jews presented their deity as being described as flesh. And the word that John uses here, uh, you know, is the same, I think, Greek root for, for carnus, where we get our, our modern day term for meat. It was a, a um, crude word, and I don't mean crude and inappropriate, but I mean crude in that it, it, John didn't choose to say Jesus became human or Jesus became man. He said Jesus became flesh. In other words, just like us. The, the Greeks never thought of their gods as like us. Even if their Greeks managed to personify themselves somehow, they were not like us. They never thought of that and, and would have, couldn't conceive of a deity being like us. The Jews certainly <laughs> didn't think, they, they were afraid to even in their worship use the name of God. And so the fact that you then would refer to God <clears throat> as as being in flesh just like us would have been uh, appalling to them too they would have said you've got to be kidding me this this is god the majestic one the great one and you're saying that he's flesh so john is about to present to them a person who is deity fully god and yet also flesh, fully human like them. Jesus was God, and Jesus was man. And that is not any different than probably what you've thought when you've read that text. But I think if you understand the background, you could see his readers would have been surprised, shocked, and would have sort of had to take a few minutes to collect themselves as to what, John, what in the world John was communicating to them. But now an important question for us is, why is that important to us? Have you, have you, and this is where I'm hoping we can open a window by maybe not just saying, oh yeah, I've studied this a million times, but open a window and think about, why is it important to me that the Word... Jesus became flesh. I think there's, I, I've thought of three, three reasons, but that's just me. Maybe you <laughs> think of some others. And, and they're somewhat overlapping. Okay. Yeah, the incarnation. Uh, how, how does it, you know... <laughs> Well, I want to come, let, let, let's, let's tease that out a little bit because I think that's a good point. What do you notice in the, particularly in the first couple of verses of John 1? Because um, this is a point I wanted to make, so thank you for raising that. What, what do you notice about that? Just in reading it in English, what does it sound a little bit like? Genesis. Yeah, Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. What do you also remember from a, a, a couple, three weeks ago, John's lesson, I think a couple weeks or a week before Christmas, maybe he talked about light. Remember in the beginning, uh, God created light. Uh, darkness was in existence. God didn't create darkness. Um, one can argue that darkness was uh, the indication that that evil lurked but nonetheless God created the light and now John tells us here in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and later on Jesus is going to proclaim himself to be the light of the world I, I don't I, I might be wrong but I don't think there's any mistake that John used language that harked back to the beginning of time to say this is how God brought man into existence now I'm going to tell you how how God brought himself as man into existence. And that is why earlier I said, I think John is among, is maybe a, a more quote unquote authentic gospel of the four gospels because John relates Jesus to us in a way that, that the others do not necessarily relate him to us. And so I think it's no accident that the incarnation and the miracle of the incarnation 
harks back to the beginning of when man was first created in the image of God, and now, and now God says, I'm going to create God in the image of man, if you will, in the form of man. Do you see that? Yes. Yes. That's right. And, and when we get to John chapter 8, uh, I, don't, I don't know who of us will be covering John chapter 8. When we get to John chapter 8, um, Jesus is going to make that point, and the Jewish people are going to lose their minds. Because he makes it in a way that's unmistakably equating himself to God uh, in, in John chapter 8. But yes, he, he, Jesus was in the beginning at the creation. You know, when God created the world, it wasn't, God wasn't just creating the world. Jesus was there and was an active part in it. The Spirit was there and was an active part in it. And those are the same Spirit and the same Jesus that we call out to and we we interact with through prayer and, and, and other means today, they were there from the beginning. They weren't Johnny come lately to the party. Absolutely. You, you asked for what are some of the implications yeah. of that, the word becoming flesh. Um, I think one, one of the comforting things for me is the realization, even after growing up in the church, that I would look at other people who talked about this communion with God in prayer and Despite trying, I couldn't get it. And one time in a dark time in my life, I realized grace in a way that I had never before because some person in the flesh was giving me grace that I didn't deserve. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't get God's grace until I experienced it from another human being in the flesh. So that's you know, one implication. The other is that Spirit can become flesh. There's spirit in the flesh around us. And the, the profound implication is that we are spirit. Me and the flesh here, you know, that, that leads to C.S. Lewis's quote, you know, if you find yourself longing for something that you can't find on this earth, maybe it's because you were destined to be connected to something out of this world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. I, I, the, the, the first point that you made actually leads me well into uh, uh, a couple things I wanted to mention, and I think you said it very well. Uh, I, it, w one of the things that I think this helps us with uh, beyond the salvation issue, the incarnation issue that we spoke about, the point that Chet made is empathy. You know, I, it, it's one thing to have a God like the Greeks had and a God like a, a God like the Jews and the people around them had when they had a little wooden statue that they created or a stone statue they created. But it's another thing to have somebody that can empathize. Not sympathize, but empathize. Been there, done that. You know, that helps me. And as, as, as Chet well said, that's a kind of God that I can relate to. If, if God didn't come in the flesh, a... a, a fair or unfair an accusation that could always be touched out there is well god doesn't really understand what it's like to be human now you 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 could say well that's a bold claim to make against god but i do think that that's one reason that god wanted to become man is god could say hey i've been there and i'm showing you how to overcome it which is the third point is it gives me something that i can lay my eyes on that I can pay attention to that I can get and understand in my finite self is deity in flesh form like me God it, l l let us say it this way when when we think of scripture we think about God and the spirit I think we struggle more so to fully understand both God and the spirit because we don't see and read about them in the same way that we read about Jesus living as a human being, just like me, but doing that as deity. 
And I think that's what the Hebrew writer meant when he said he's the exact representation of the Father. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I think that's why he, why he said those things is it gives us something that we can hang our hat on. I, I can't, if, if Chet was nothing more than some idea and wasn't a, a physical person like me that I could see and talk to, I, I would have a harder time conceptualizing and relating to him. And so I think that that's, that's one of the, the other things that, that we can get out of this notion of Jesus coming in the flesh. And I think we need to cling on to that. And I think, in, if, you know, if you read through the book of Hebrews, I think you, you also see why the Hebrew writer made that statement in chapter 1 is because I think that notion carries through as he's talking about how Jesus is better than what you had under the old law. And I think part of that is because in chapter 4 and chapter 5, you can approach the throne of grace. You've got somebody who's been there, done that. You've got somebody you can talk to who's lived life like you have. It's not some faraway deity that we can't comprehend, but it's something we can comprehend. You know, Jesus probably stubbed his toe. He probably banged his head. He pro- I mean, I, I think it's unrealistic to think that Jesus lived a life and magically nothing ever happened to him. He didn't ever get a cut. He didn't ever fall down. He didn't ever, we, we know that he was sad. We know that he was probably at times, I think, happy. We have indications that he experienced emotions like we do. And that's helpful to know that he did. And therefore, I can, in those emotions, I can bring them under his control and experience them. And there's nothing wrong with it. He wasn't some robot that had unfeeling that he was never sad, never happy. He just went about life. No, he was like us. But he did it as God. And that's the point that John wants his readers to see is We've got somebody now who can live as God, but live as us, and we can hang our hat on that. All right, in the time we have left, I want to get to, um, I want to skip ahead to the end of, of chapter one. Um, <clears throat> I, the, 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 that first part that we went through is, I think, is very important to understanding the book and getting through it. Uh, but quite honestly, this last part, I think, is the part that has even more relevance for us. But I think we've got time to do it justice. We just may um, have to accelerate just a little bit. Beginning in verse uh, 45, Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were under a fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under a fig tree. You'll see greater things than that. I tell you the truth, you shall see the heavens open, uh, heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. How many times in Scripture do we read about Nathaniel? This is one of them. Is there more than one? <laughs> Dose. <laughs> There's two times we read about Nathaniel. John chapter 1 and John chapter 21. The end of the book of John. And at the end of the book of John, we just see his name and we find out there that he was from Cana. Cana. And that, that's it. Those are the only times that we read Nath- of Nathaniel in all of Scripture. Now, this part I'm going to go through really fast because I want to get to the meat and potatoes. Um, th- whether, you, whether you think that Nathaniel is some follower of Jesus that Philip introduced to him here in John chapter 1, or whether you think Nathaniel is perhaps Bartholomew and it's just that he's called Nathaniel here and he's called Bar- Bartholomew elsewhere, 
okay, I'm not going to fuss with you either way. I probably tend to think the latter, but there's nothing in Scripture that would support that other than maybe a, an argument of ordering. When you see names fit together in, in, in repetitive fashion, you can say, well, if A equals C and B equals C, then A must equal B kind of thing. Um, so, having said that, what do you make of this interaction? What, how would you describe Nathaniel when Philip comes to him and says, hey, we've, in essence, we found the Messiah. We found the one that Moses and the prophets have talked about. And, uh, you know, we think he's the real deal. And Philip says what? <laughs> Can anything come out of Nazareth? Yeah, he hears he's from Nazareth. Now, Nazareth was a little way south of Cana. They were not far apart. They were both pretty small towns, both relatively insignificant in their time. There would have been nothing that would have said, you know, anything big. You know, I, 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 won't, I won't go there as to say what kind of towns we might, <laughs> we might say somebody's from there and say that's no big deal. But that, that's in essence what happened is Philip or, or Nathaniel said, can anything come out of Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip just simply says, come and see. First question is, do you think that Philip knew something and that's why he just said, well, why don't you come and see? Or do you think Philip was just taking a flyer and just hoping that it might turn into something? No right or wrong answers. Just, I'm just curious as to what you think. The first one? Yeah. Yeah. I agree, and I think we see that from Philip repetitively in uh, John chapter 11. When we get to that later on, we'll see that Philip was bringing people to Jesus. Philip may not have always known what to say or what to do, but he knew to bring people to Jesus. He, connect, he was a connector and connected people to Jesus. And so I think here, uh, that's right. I, I believe he thought, okay, you're not going to believe anything I'm going to say, but why don't you just come and see? And behold, <laughs> Nathaniel came and he did see. When, when he's walking up, Jesus says, hey, there's an Israelite in whom there is no guile. And I'll use that word guile. I think it's a little, uh, I, I like that word better for conveying the meaning here. Interesting thing, only time that the term Israelite is used by John is here. John talks about Jews all the time, but he uses the term Israelite here. I don't, I'm not sure what to make of that other than maybe it's a mark of distinction that you are different. You are not like most of the Jews. You are different and unique in your perspective. And he says, someone in whom there is no guile. That's, that's a good thing to have said about you, particularly if it comes from the Lord. That term is the same term it, that's, that's used in the Septuagint in, in uh, Genesis when um, Esau comes back and is, uh, is asking for his um, Isaac for his uh, blessing. And Esau says, or I mean, Isaac says, uh, I'm sorry, Esau, but your brother Jacob has deceitfully taken uh, your birthright or taken your blessing. That deceitfully, uh, it, the Hebrew word there is translating the Septuagint using the Greek word. It's the same Greek word that's used here uh, for guile. Um, so just as Jacob was a deceiver, uh, Jesus says Nathaniel was most certainly not a deceiver. And, and we see further indication of that because then right after he says that, it's interesting, <laughs> Nathaniel's reaction isn't, oh, well, well, thank you for saying that. Or, well, I try not to be. He acts just like it's a given. He says, how do you know me? Now, that is almost sure proof of somebody who likely, e either they're so far gone that they're off the rails or somebody who truly is guileless that can just say, well, how do you know me? You know, an interesting point. Now, and Jesus says, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree. When? What's the text say? I saw you when you were under the fig tree before Philip called you. <laughs> not after Philip called you. Not after Philip told me about you. Before Philip called you. Before I knew who you were. Before I knew you. The, um, did the, oh, that bell hasn't rang. Okay. So, so now, 
the, then we see the turnaround. Immediately after Jesus says that, Nathanael's response is, Rabbi, son of God and the king of Israel, you're surely, you, Rabbi, you are surely the son of God and the king of Israel. That you in the Greek is emphatic. You know, it's not you maybe or you somebody, it's you. You are the one. Why the turnaround in Nathaniel? That, that's a big question I always had about that passage. There was something about Jesus saying, I saw you before, that made, that caught Nathaniel's eye to say, surely this is the Son of God. Um, maybe there was a facial expression there or something. Maybe Philip was doing or thinking something that only Jesus could have known, mm -hmm. um, but something gave him no doubt. Maybe Philip was doing something he shouldn't have been doing. Yeah, you know. yeah. Two two things, real quick. Um, it it is unquestionable that Nathaniel, whatever whatever Nathaniel was thinking, whatever Nathaniel was praying, whatever Nathaniel was doing. Whatever was going on in Nathaniel's life, he recognized was laid open before this man that he was skeptical of now saw it and was aware of it and didn't comment on it other than just say, I saw you when you were under the fig tree. Now, I will say, under, the, under a fig tree was not an uncommon place for Jews to gather for shade in the heat, etc. It was also not an uncommon place for the Jewish teachers and rabbis to gather for periods of study and meditation. So whether Nathaniel was having prayer time under there, whether he's doing Bible study under there, or whether he was just sitting under there thinking the whole world has gone to pot and, and why is my life such a wreck, something was going on in his life. And when Jesus pointed that out, it hit him like a ton of bricks. Um, last thing to tie together. I think that this at the end of chapter 1 fits in well. And the reason John uh, inserts this story here when Nathaniel, nothing is said about him anywhere else, is think about it this way. At the beginning of the chapter, John introduces his readers, both Greek and Gentile, to the concept that Jesus came in the flesh. Deity came in the flesh, which hit them and shocked them. At the end, he tells a story about Nathaniel when Nathaniel was hit and shocked by the flip side of that, a human being, a man in the flesh, who is able to tell him something that he recognized went way beyond human capability. Do you see that? John hits us with deity becoming flesh at the beginning, and at the end, he hits us with flesh conveying ideas that only deity could possibly have had in, in terms of life transformation. And that's what the gospel message is about, and that's how Jesus transformed Nathaniel's life, is by saying, I cared about you, I saw you, I knew you were hurting, I knew you were struggling, I knew something was going on. Because you don't change somebody like Nathaniel that fast. A, he was without guile. And B, he clearly had no compunction about saying what he thought if he thought something was garbage because he was without guile. And he turns right around on a dime and says, Rabbi, you, you are the Son of God and the King of Israel. Both. Hope you have a great week. Thank you for your attention.